Good afternoon, I'm Liz Powell. I am the uh, founder of G2G Consulting, and I am going to kick things off today and work with my colleagues here to make sure that we cover all the key aspects of MHSRS, the biggest annual military medical conference of the year, as well as um, just general information about defense funding for uh, bioscience, life science companies. Um, so with that, we'd love to go to the next slide. So this is what we'll cover today. Some just general background introduction. Some of you know us already and some of you do not. So we wanna start out with a little bit of background. Then we will get into the different funding sources that are out there. Talk about some key targets, which of course includes Department of Defense. And then our grant tracking system, which is our GBG reporting service that we provide um, on a monthly basis. And then we'll get into the DOD nuances, how the system is set up, funding streams, and this conference. Um, we've got lots of good details based on years of experience attending these conferences that we want to share with you so that you can plan for successful involvement this year, and especially with the abstract deadline just around the corner just a few weeks away. We will end with Q&A and final tips and welcome any questions that you have throughout the program. So please use that chat box, the Q&A box, um, and we will work to make sure we get to them. If we can't get to them all during this hour today, then we will do a follow-up in our email to everyone who is registered. We will, we're recording today and we will send you a copy of the slide. So you will be well taken care of, hopefully. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so a little bit of background. So again, I'm Liz Powell, head of G2G. What does G2G stand for? Government to growth. That's what we were all about. I started G2G 15 years ago now. Um, after working on Capitol Hill as a legislative director, I staffed the Armed Services Committee. I managed all the appropriations requests. Um, I did a lot of health policy work. Uh, I'm an attorney and I have a master's in public health. Um, so that's sort of my unique background of why the heck we're so involved in military medical work. Um, but what I was able to do is to build this awesome team, some of whom you're seeing today. We are bipartisan and we have this great niche in military medical in particular, where we can connect life science companies to military medical funding opportunities. Um, and so that's a niche for us. We do broader work across um, the government affairs landscape. So that includes CMS reimbursement, it includes regulatory comments, it includes closing the gap between FDA approval and CMS reimbursement. It includes um, ballot act and tons of different legislative measures happening in Congress, as well as the annual appropriations process. So we do a lot of different things. I would say our best metric is the $513 million that we've raised since I started the firm. Um, so that's about us. We're in a few different locations. As you can see, we have a, a Midwest office in Cleveland. We also have an office in Columbus that does our state house work. And then we are based in DC. We also have satellite operations in Boston, Virginia, um, Pittsburgh, where we've had many years of work with clients and great innovators over the years. We do work with nonprofits as well. We've worked with academic uh, research institutions. Um, uh, however, we've done more in the biosciences and we found that a lot of the biosciences struggle for access to capital. And that's the problem that we're trying to solve. And I think we do a pretty good, good job at and what we wanna to cover today. Um, finally, you can see, I think I talked about our niche, our GBG report, Greg will cover that, our affiliations, I think that just helps us um, keep our ear to the ground and know what is going on in the military medical funding space and broader opportunities for funding for life sciences. Next slide, please. So this slide shows us the different funding sources that are out there. So when people say they got funding from the government, there's really four ways to get it. One is through legislation. And within that, it's either appropriations bill or an authorization bill. Second are grants, which I'm sure folks know, grants.gov, um, that there are lots of different grants, SBIRs, there's lots of grants out there. Um, third is discretionary. So each uh, secretary of a department has discretionary funds that they can spend on certain initiatives. Um, there's also discretionary funds if at the end of a funding cycle, they um, have fund, an agency has funding and uh, they either spend it or lose it, they can use some of that discretionary authority there. Other times I've, I've talked with program managers who put out an announcement but didn't get 
applications back in that really aligned with that announcement and that can create some opportunities as well. So especially within the military, um, that is a really good opportunity for folks if they submit white papers. And we're gonna talk about white papers in a little bit. The fourth category is procurement. So ideally you're on this pathway of doing early R&D, collaborative work with um, DOD and other agencies, and you are pulled through all the way to procurement because they've invested in you early and helped develop your product, your innovation, your pharmaceutical device, diagnostic, whatever it is, they are then more inclined to then want to buy it for military use, for VA use, for broader application. So you see that red circle there? That makes it pretty clear where all the funding is. The biggest source of funding is within the Department of Defense. Huge numbers when you compare that to NIH, BARDA, and these other entities. So we pursue funding, collaborations, policy opportunities with all of these agencies and departments. However, today we're talking about defense because of that red circle. It's absolutely clear that the most funding comes out of defense. It is a huge opportunity. And we have found over the years that most life sciences struggle to figure out how to navigate defense. So we want to break that down for you. So next slide, please. This just shows you the procurement side and the R&D side of things. So you can see that there's a huge amount of dollars that are spent every year in R&D. Um, and so... That's the takeaway for that one. Again, there's more money coming out of DOD. <laughs> Next slide. And so there's a process to how this funding works. Um, so I've talked about the four categories of funding, and now I want to talk about the timing and the process. So first, every year, the president comes out with the budget. The budget um, is usually due in early February. This year, there will be a delay we are hearing. We literally were just on Capitol Hill talking about this, that they expect it um, very late this year, at least a couple months late, which will push back the appropriations process and push back some of the granting programs. So it does affect all of us when there are delays. Why is there the delay? Well, last year, they're supposed to get their appropriations bills done by the end of September, they instead did continuing resolutions and then finally did what we call an omnibus bill with all the different appropriations put into one big omnibus package. And they got that done very end of December. And so that delayed their ability to plan for this year's funding process. So that budget comes out. That is like a proposal, an outline of what the president wants to see funded. Um, he works in partnership with OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, to produce that document. Um, and then Congress responds to that and says, okay, yeah, we like this or we don't like that. And it doesn't matter uh, what party each entity is, um, no matter what, it's always broken down. And so in the House, they break it down into 12 appropriation subcommittees in the House and 12 in the Senate. All funding measures start in the House and they move through the House and then the Senate catches up. At the end of the year, they do these negotiations or what we call conference committee where they hammer out differences and ideally have 12 different appropriations bills, but often it's usually an omnibus or a mini bus where they package a few of them together. There's always one bill for defense appropriations that's directing how DOD will spend funding. Simultaneously, there's the NDAA, which is the National Defense Authorization Act. This also is done every year. So really there's 13 bills that are done every year, no matter what. These other authorization bills that you hear about are done every three to five years, sometimes longer. So that is what makes the appropriations and NDAA particularly distinctive. Congress directs DOD to spend funds in a certain way, to take on new initiatives, to focus on certain health issues, like we saw a lot with the burn pits focus with cancer. We saw a new rare cancer line created. We've seen... Um, more funding streams uh, flow through DOD because of Congress. Um, and it is a combination of the president and Congress, but it really is Congress that is putting these specific funding lines around certain health conditions. Um, so along the way, there's an opportunity to put in earmarks where you specifically say a recipient, all earmarks must go to nonprofits or municipalities. No business can be a recipient. However, a business can partner with a nonprofit. So you could partner with a research institution, for example, if you wanted to do trauma care research program through a Department of Defense that went through to a nonprofit institution and partnered with you to execute that work, for example. 
Um, and then there's tons of funding directives that directly impact businesses, but it's not saying that the funds go to the business. And we do a lot of that work. Um, so as I said, it starts with the White House coming out with their proposal, then Congress responds to it. Usually Q1, it's going to go into Q2 this year. Um, House does it first, then the Senate follows suit. And by the summer, you have some idea of what these bills look like. And then in the fall is when they're supposed to finish them. But often they will do a continuing resolution in, in September and finish off somewhere between October, November, December. Um, agencies and departments have a role in this process too. So they are reliant on that final omnibus or final appropriations bills to be enacted before they can release new funds or do new programming. So the downside of a continuing resolution is they can't do anything new, they're sort of stuck. So that is why many people advocate quite strongly for new uh, omnibus or appropriations bill every year to give that leeway to an agency to do new things and also get increased funding for certain initiatives. Um, so the agencies based on those funding streams and, the, and what is enacted into law, they issue grants, broad agency announcements, program announcements, the SBIR program, which um, is through every department that spends $100 million or more on research. They have to have a carve out for SBIRs. Um, there's pilot programs or demonstration grants. There's contracting opportunities. Once you make it through phase one, phase two, you can get a phase three contract, for example. Um, so there's different uh, mechanisms for uh, dispersing these dollars, um, but that is generally how the departments and agencies work. And for all of us on this call that we care about with DOD, there's the CDMRP program, Congressionally Directed Military Research Program. Every spring, they come out with a bunch of opportunities and um, so that's something that we look for every year, but that can be delayed if the budget process isn't complete on time. So all of these three lines um, affect each other um, and are all kind of moving throughout the year. Um, and uh, I would say a takeaway for you is to just understand that overlap and make sure that you are talking to your members of Congress about the importance of federal funding for research. They need to hear that regularly from their constituents. Next slide, please. And I will pass it to my colleague, Greg Kepker. Thanks a lot, Liz. That was awesome to set the stage for kind of where the pots of money are and then how that flows and how the systems of government tie together. Um, so when we when we pick up with, with grants and, and funding for um, nonprofit well, for companies. Um, we are building towards the MHSRS abstract and how to make the most of that conference. But before we get there, we just wanted to talk about some key targets and just make sure we've got some baseline knowledge. And this slide here is really just more of a um, reference slide so that you can see the list um, for federal departments. We're going to go into many of these here in a couple slides, so I won't belabor the issue here, but also make note of the key conferences that are, are listed. And again, we'll talk primarily about MHSRS today. So we will send these slides out, and this is just kind of a teaser for what we're going to be talking about. So let's go to the next slide, Aditya. But before we go there, um, Liz had mentioned our Government Bioscience Grants Report. And um, this is something that we publish every month. It's a compilation of monthly opportunities that are in the bioscience, life science, high tech industry space. And it's really a curated, curated from multiple sources. So the slide that we looked at previously and the ones that we're going to go over here in a little bit um, really are the sources of where we find these grant opportunities. And like I said, we curate them into this publication each month. It's a, a provides a um, quick summary of what a title and opportunity numbers are, um, focusing more recently on released opportunities. We also flag those opportunities that are pre-announcements so that the research community can get a, get a jump on what's going to be due here in the, in the month, or show, month or so. It comes with a short description along with deadlines and funding levels, and then most importantly, direct hyperlinks to the actual announcement. So this is a service that we provide to um, companies and clients that we work with directly. We also provide a monthly service. You see here, um, it's $100 a month to gain access to the report, along with a webinar that we do. Uh, we do 
every third Friday of the month, we get together and walk through the report for about 30 minutes. Um, that's open to everybody. And then the, the second 30 minutes is uh, a private session with clients and companies and those who have purchased the report to do a deeper dive into those opportunities that may be of interest or just to talk about some intel or just to offer a uh, consultation on how best to approach and go after money. So um, that's always a possibility. And I think we can go to the next slide. So as far as government grants go, we find that companies interested in grant funding tend to be uh, really familiar with NIH, especially in, in the bioscience space, also familiar with SBIRs and STTRs. So we're really not going to go into the specifics of those, but just to mention that grants.gov is probably the most familiar site along with SAM.gov, which is really the one-stop shop to register your company to be able to apply and receive money from the government. And um, it also provides listings of contract opportunities, contract data repository, um, wage, wage determination, things like that. Um, one of our biggest recommendations for anybody that is interested in doing uh, business with the government or want to go after grants is make sure that your SAM.gov registration and grants.gov registrations are all in order and you've got your your um, unique identifying uh, unique entity ID, which is now coming. If you set up a SAM.gov account, you're going to automatically get that. So all of that will be important um, to apply for really any grant opportunity. Uh, when we look at the America's Seed Fund through the National Science Foundation, they have an SBIR STT our program. And they offer a really cool thing that we talk about quite frequently in our monthly calls about these project pitches, where it allows startups and small businesses to get quick feedback on uh, your application before you actually submit a phase one SBIR. And it's a pretty easy lift. Um, it's straightforward. The descriptions that you have to provide are anywhere from 500 words or down to 250 words. So it's not like doing a full submission and you can actually get feedback on what you're proposing. And there are 30 areas of interest uh, within the NSF project pitch that range anywhere from advanced manufacturing to biological and biomedical technologies, digital health, energy and environmental technologies, the Internet of Things, medical devices, nanotechnology, pharmaceuticals, robotics. And then they have this wonderful category that is a catch-all other. And they literally say, if you don't know where your, your technology or your proposal fits, submit it to other. And um, so just always want to flag that as an opportunity. Uh, BARDA is the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. We've heard a lot about BARDA throughout the pandemic. Um, we know that they're all about medical countermeasures, such as chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear incidents, as well as pandemic influenza and emerging infectious diseases. So if you're in that space, um, you're probably already familiar with BARDA. And um, just wanted to mention that they've got within that CARBEX, which is focused on antimicrobial resistance and developing new antibiotics and other life-saving products that combat drug-resistant bacteria. There's also the BARDA DRIVE program, which, uh, pr which stands for Division of Research, Innovation, and Ventures. And through DRIVE, there's an easy broad agency announcement, which uh, is for awards under $750,000. And they've got a broad agency category that uh, awards much higher uh, pay grades and, and funding amounts. So let's go to the next slide. And here again, just kind of laying out some, some opportunities. Now we're getting closer to the DOD ones, but um, the US Army Medical Research and Development Command is the Army's medical material developer. And their responsibility is for medical research, development, and acquisition. Uh, so if you're in the infectious disease space, have medical devices or products related to combat casualty care, operational medicine, blast injury research, all of that is going to come through uh, USA MRDC. And we've seen a transition where a lot of this is now falling under the Defense Health Agency. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Um, Liz had mentioned the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. This is promoting medical research funding opportunities 
that are addressing two things, critical needs within the military, but also the general public. Um, the CDMRP grants or, or calls for, for applications serve a dual purpose. So it's research for military and the public. And how does this all tie together? So if we think back to, or look back at the slides that Liz had gone through about Congress and how all of that is determined, Congress actually sets the funding level for CDMRP and also the topics that are covered. And there are nearly 40 research categories within CDMRP that range from alcohol and substance abuse to autism, to several categories in the cancer space that includes breast cancer, kidney, lung, ovarian, pancreatic, uh, prostate, rare cancers. I mean, there's just a ton of cancer opportunities there. And we actually worked on a, a project that lobbied to get rare cancers added to this list with a funding line. Uh, there's a combat readiness, multiple sclerosis, military burn. Uh, there's a peer-reviewed medical research category. So if, if you are in the medical, medical device space or medical research, there's 50 topics alone in the peer-reviewed medical research call and, and uh, programs. So that's definitely something to check out. Um, CDMRP is also very interested in TBI and how that impacts um, uh, military personnel, but also the public in general and vision. So just wanted to give you a flavor of some of the topics there, CDMRP. Uh, in fact, we just, uh, there was a webinar that we attended last week and we've got a blog on our website that lists um, how to best work with CDMRP and some things, kind of the basics and ins and outs of how to work with them. So that's something separate. Uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, this has been called the agency that shaped the modern world. So if you, they, they've been involved with, uh, they were involved with the COVID-19 vaccine, the internet, weather satellites, GPS, drones, voice interfaces, per, the personal computer, um, are all things that DARPA can claim at least partial credit for. And um, I've heard them say that projects that come through DARPA are not about building a better mousetrap, but making the possible the impossible possible. Um, so if your idea is already being done, it's not likely a fit for DARPA, but if your idea is not being done and um, no one knows if it's possible or it'll work, it's probably something that, that DARPA would be interested in if it's fitting within their categories. And there are a couple funding pathways through DARPA. They have an office for broad agency announcements, and then they have a program broad agency announcement as well. Um, then MTech, just to quickly mention the Medical Technology Enterprise Consortium. So there are a few consortiums out there that partner with the DOD as their customer, and um, they offer solicitations and calls or requests for prototype proposals. And within MTech, you do have to be a member of, of the organization to be able to apply um, I do want to mention that as far as membership goes, it's it could range anywhere from 5,000 5, for uh, multi-member organizations or as little as a uh, I'm sorry, 5,000 for large businesses or a thousand for small businesses. And the nice thing about MTech is if you join at different parts through the year, they would prorate their membership rate. Um, but the key here with a, with a consortium like this is if there's a funding opportunity that you want to apply for, again, you have to be a member. And they use what are called other transaction agreements or OTAs. And it just allows them a little bit more flexibility than they might find in other traditional funding sources. And, and it just allows them to um, uh, adopt and incorporate business practices that reflect the commercial industry standards and best practices. And it's an award mechanism that is a little bit easier to manage. Um, okay, so with that, uh, let's go to the next slide and want to start to make this transition over to the DOD and just to build on the, the pie chart that Liz talked about where we saw a majority of the government funding does fall within DOD. This becomes an opportunity that if you have technology or ideas or research or proposals that, that could fit there and also benefit the civilian population, this is definitely something to consider and to, to realize here that this slide is really to give you a sense of how big the military health system is. It serves over 9 million beneficiaries and has hundreds of locations 
uh, with military hospital medical clinics and military treatment facilities and such. So the next slide. Um, just a little bit about the DOD opportunities and mention about um, Army, the Defense Health Agency. This is the organization that um, is now leading the, the mental health systems integration of readiness and health. And it's actually a joint operation between the Army, Navy, and Air Force, and primarily around medical services that provide medically ready, a medically ready force and health services. We're also seeing some of the research dollars flowing under DHA. Um, there's the Army's Future Command, which is aimed at modernizing the Army. And um, we mentioned USA MRDC. Something to consider um, if you're going to work with the DOD, there are opportunities through what are called Cooperative Research and Development Agreements, or CRADAs. And this is not necessarily something that comes with money, but it is an opportunity to get your foot in the door, work with uh, researchers within the military, potentially go after some intramural funding, which might be only available, which would only be available to those working within the DOD, um, as opposed to the extramural funding, which is available to industry. But uh, the CRADA is a, is a way to find a common goal and you bring resources to the table. Maybe you're bringing your product the DOD has their researchers, maybe they're providing an animal model to test your, your drug or to test your device. And it's just a good way to get your foot in the door. And then obviously conferences and workshops are other ways to um, engage with the DOD. And we're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about MHSRS and how to uh, engage in that conference, but also submit an abstract for uh, the upcoming deadline. And then I'll just quickly mention here um, the legislation. We won't go into detail in it, but just wanted to tie that back to what Liz had mentioned earlier about the systems and that there's the National Defense Authorization Act and then there are the appropriations bills. All of those things kind of tie into how the money flows, how much is there and what it is there to pay for. So just something to keep in mind. And Aditya, with that, we'll go to the next slide and turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Greg, for that really comprehensive overview. Um, so now we'll go into discussing MHSRS in a little bit more detail. Um, as Liz mentioned at the outset, uh, this is the largest military medical conference of the year. Uh, it lasts four days and will be held this year in mid-August uh, of this year in Kissimmee, Florida. So this is in contrast to last year when the conference was actually held in mid-September and a return to form uh, of how it was before the pandemic, so years 2019 and prior. Um, so this is a conference that's really well attended by folks from various quarters associated with the DOD, um, including folks from industry, academia, clinicians and researchers uh, who are in the department, uh, department healthcare leadership, uh, DOD program managers, as well as uh, their counterparts and collaborators at the at the VA. And so if I remember correctly, last year was uh, the conference had the highest attendance they ever recorded. Um, so it had about 4,000 participants or so. Um, and uh, it was quite an experience, I will say, having gone uh, to a large in-person conference after uh, two years of, of the pandemic. Um, any case, so the conference is uh, divided into four um, really broad topic areas or themes, and they are um, warfighter medical readiness, expeditionary medicine and prolonged field care, war, warfighter performance, and return to duty. And so uh, these focus areas are then further subdivided into about uh, 50 different uh, breakout sessions uh, whose topics uh, encompass a wide array of research and development priorities of interest in the military, um, including, um, as you can see here, things like infectious diseases, hemorrhage control, um, and the blood product space, pain management, regenerative medicine, uh, analytics, decision making, mental health, TBI, women's health. So that's just a non exhaustive list, um, but it's about 50 plus topics there. Um, and so these breakout sessions, like any other scientific conference, involve um, uh, several different podium sessions where speakers can give 50-minute talks on their uh, particular area of work. 
Concurrently, um, participants can also be selected for poster presentations, uh, which are done at three distinct sessions over the course of the four-day conference. Uh, the forum also provides the opportunity for vendors to highlight their products and services, and this takes place in the exhibit hall um, on one or two days of the conference. And so uh, the benefits of attending this conference, even if your work or your product or your research don't, at least the current time, align precisely with any of the topics um, affiliated with the breakout sessions is pretty big. Um, and so one piece is the insights that you get at the conference from all these high level DOD leaders. And so they really outline in plain language what the on ongoing and emerging priorities of the military health system is. And that knowledge can allow you to help frame or reframe your work so that it's better aligned with military priorities um, and allow you uh, the opportunity to collaborate with those folks. Um, of course, it goes without saying that like with any conference, um, it's an unparalleled opportunity to network, but given how big this is and how comprehensive it is, it really is uh, the main, the main highlight of, of this of this meeting. Um, and so even if uh, folks there aren't uh, aren't directly um, interested in what you're doing, um, chances are that someone there will know, say half a dozen other people in their network who can put you in contact uh, with someone who who might know uh, someone who might be interested in what you're working on. So it's that kind of um, connection building uh, forum. Um, and lastly, while it sounds somewhat basic, just getting exposure to the military health system is a major benefit from attending this conference, even if you don't end up submitting an abstract. Um, the whole system uh, can be a little bit overwhelming, but the downstream rewards of successful engagement um, with the military at this forum is manifold. Um, it takes time, it takes multiple touch points. Um, but getting to know the right people uh, is important. And so GDG has gone to this conference for years now, and we really helped a lot of uh, groups that we work with make really meaningful connections uh, that help them advance their priorities, advance their business in a way that was also aligned with the military's priorities. I think last year uh, in 2021, I believe we helped out at least at least a dozen folks, a dozen different groups who were trying to engage. Um, and we look forward to doing that again this year. Um, and so moving on, uh, as Liz had mentioned again at the outset, um, the abstract process, if you do want to do a podium presentation or submit for a poster, the abstracts are due uh, pretty soon in about in less than three weeks time on February 19th. And so uh, there's no virtual component here. Everything is going to be in person, um, but they do have a pretty uh, streamlined process for submitting abstracts through the MHSRS online portal. So going into a little bit more detail there. Um, so as with pretty much any conference, you do need to set up an account on their on their website and get your registration set up. Um, I think that does take a little bit of time, so something to consider. Uh, but the actual abstract itself is a little bit different uh, in the sense that uh, you can only submit abstracts that contain plain text without any visuals. Um, so if you're used to submitting abstracts uh, that have a lot of fancy diagrams, charts, you really need to, uh, it's imperative to really rethink how you're getting your message across in words only. Um, and I would again stress that even though networking um, is important at this conference and talking about what you do is important, actually doing any sort of product promotion or sales pitches within the abstract is strictly prohibited and will result in you. Uh, getting denied to um, speak either at a podium or, pre or a poster session. So do not do that. Um, what you can do, um, what you are allowed to include. So again, it has the standard components of your abstracts that you're probably used to if you attend scientific conferences regularly. You're allowed a lengthy title. You're allowed a pretty hefty um, body to actually describe your work, about 8,000 characters um, or about 1,500 words, give or take. Um, additionally, you need to include a disclaimer um, about your interests. And it's also important to note that in your abstract, you need to specify what the learning objectives are. So what do you expect your audience at these different uh, breakout sessions to actually learn or do? Um, and so there's specific questions that they have um, that they have included for guidance there. Um, and they really stress that uh, they want this spelled out very clearly with about 225 characters devoted to each of those three learning objectives. Um, 
and they advise you to use pretty clear action verbs uh, to um, outline those objectives. Additionally, as with a lot of other uh, conferences, you do need to submit a conflict of interest form, and it also provides the opportunity to upload your um, uh, CV, at least for the primary investigator or presenter. Going into a little bit more detail, um, so one thing that's a little bit different about abstract submission this year, as opposed to other years, is that there's actually two distinct types of abstracts that you can submit depending on how advanced your work is. Um, and so the first is a fairly conventional research abstract. Um, so your standard introduction, materials, methods, results, and conclusions. So um, nothing too, nothing too um, out there here. However, the second type is if you have a essentially a product that's pretty mature and fulfills a key DoD capability gap. And so there's a couple of different points of differentiation between these two abstracts, as you can read here. So you can go into a little bit more technical detail about what capability gaps you're meeting, and you sort of have to stress a little bit more um, how your product or product in development is actually impacting the readiness, uh, welfare, well-being of the warfighter, um, current and present. Um, lastly, to round it out, um, I will say, however, that both, both these abstracts, regardless of which type you eventually submit, uh, they're evaluated by the same broad metrics, uh, which include the basic quality of the abstract, um, an underrated, um, underrated metric, I would say myself, um, the scientific merit, and then the completion, then the relevance and impact to the warfighter. Um, and so there are each category is again given a score of one through five, one being the highest, and then they're weighted in a way to give a final score. And then the decision is made whether to uh, permit you to do a podium or present podium or a poster presentation. Um, and so I think that's that wraps up my section. I will turn it back over to Liz to round this out with uh, tips for engaging with the DoD at MHSRS and beyond. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so just for some final takeaways, you want to make sure that you're tracking um, the opportunities that are out there. You can be using our GBG um, reporting service and the monthly call that where we talk uh, through some key opportunities and actually do some consultation and um, answer your questions directly. I think that's a really good resource, but also just on your own as you develop relationships by going to the MHSRS conference and other conferences, you can um, gain access to information and opportunities. Writing these white papers so that they clearly communicate problem solution results is really, really important. That's the template that they use. And at the end of the year where they have that spend it or lose it, uh, that is usually in the summer through end of September, they go back to those white papers and they pick through and they say, okay, this aligns with our mission, this aligns with this directorate. Um, so those can be really helpful. So learning to communicate effectively with those is really important. Understanding the program goals and the intent of the award mechanisms and criteria, sort of a lot in that bullet point, but the key is to understand what are their goals so that you're aligning with their goals. And the intent of the award mechanism, we have actually worked with clients who misread um, how the there were several different opportunities within CDMRP, for example, um, to address a health condition but they were different kinds of awards like discovery versus advanced development type of thing. So just make sure that you are aligning with what that award mechanism is trying to accomplish. And you gotta fit the criteria. If you don't have these basics down, then just either see how you can fit in or don't apply, like don't waste your time um, on something that you won't have a chance at. Uh, and something else that helps you ensure that you understand whether you really have a chance or not is the next bullet talking to program managers, really getting to know them and getting them to understand your innovation and your pathway to bringing innovation to patients and service members is really important because they will give you honest and, and helpful feedback. And you really want that champion from within saying, we, we really want to fund this research. We want to bring this to service members. That will be really key. Um, and you can develop those relationships at MHSRS. So um, really important to go to that conference and to really figure out who would be the key folks for you to work with in going after funding. 
following deadlines, um, understanding budget guidelines, that's always an obvious but very important one. Um, and getting the registrations done long before the deadline. Um, so the DUNS, the SAN, the EBRAP, all these different steps that you have to take, they're all online systems that you have to register for. Just make sure those are done uh, well before the deadline to make the submission. Um, you want to keep the pre-application and quad chart short, simple, clear, to the point, uh, very important, not too sciencey. Um, while a lot of the reviewers obviously have a science background, they might not know your particular area of science. Um, and you are, you know, novel, you're working on something that they maybe haven't seen before. So just make sure it's super clear. Um, they can understand it even if they aren't a specialist in your particular area. Um, you want to make sure that you're checking um, who the grant reviewers are, which is all published public information. Um, look at past awards because that'll show you what they looked for before um, that might guide you in making a submission now. Again, keeping up conversations with the program managers really helps with this as well. Um, I think the CDMRP website is actually pretty helpful. It gives you information that's, that uh, can help guide putting together an application, a submission, um, and remember paying attention to the different kinds of grants, like whether they're looking to fund early research or later research, for example. Um, remember who decides the CDMRP topics. It's Congress, right? So they um, want to hear from you if you have any chance to interact with your members of Congress, which you do. You can always send letters in or you can go to one of their town halls. But you want to make sure that they know, um, you know, I'm I'm active in the cancer research space. Therefore, this CDMRP program or uh, peer-reviewed cancer research program is a specific cancer one is really important to me. That's something I apply for every year. So please make sure you keep funding that. Or even more specifically, it could be breast cancer, prostate cancer, the rare cancer research program, which we helped create a few years ago now. Um, and has continued to get um, increased funding and is now at 17.5 million. So um, the only reason we were able to do that is because we told Congress how important this research was and that um, they had the power to fund it um, and that rare cancers in particular were getting neglected. So um, there's real power in talking to your member of Congress. So please don't be shy about that. They do work for us after all uh, as taxpayers. Um, the next one is explore consortiums and broad agency announcements or BAs or BAs as they call them within DOD. DOD calls them BAs. Everyone else calls them BAAs. DOD calls them SPURS instead of SBIRs. So um, there are those nuances, but they're all the same thing. Um, and uh, there are these entities that have really popped up over the past several years that can be really um, helpful partners and funding sources. So um, make sure that you're networked in with those. And like MTech has an upcoming um, annual meeting in Virginia and Richmond. Um, so we're sort of teaming up with some of our Richmond folks that we work with, including Virginia Bio, to see how we can collaborate and sort of expand the access there. So they are very open to that. They're always looking to get more innovators into their system. And so they want to work with you. They want to be accessible. Um, they want their program funding to relate to you. So again, don't be shy with them, just like you're not shy with Congress or with program managers. And by the way, a lot of those folks will be at um, MHS or SL have exhibits uh, in the exhibit hall, and they'll be um, attending that conference. So you can even schedule one-on-one -on -one time with them there. Um, collaborating with the military via the CRADAs, um, the cooperative agreements are really helpful. While it's not funding, it's a really good first step to get toward funding. Um, so we've seen that. We've helped arrange CRADAs with our clients, um, with agencies, and help that turn into dollars where together they're able to apply for funding um, that they could not apply for a loan, for, a loan, for example, intramural funding. You could definitely not do that as an outside company, but if you're partnering with the DOD lab on a research project, you can do that together. So um, there really are advantages. And then there's just the credibility. I think um, a lot of these defense programs, they want to see military um, nexus. It's not necessarily required for um, the CNMEP program, but it's definitely preferred. So there's another reason um, to do a CRADA. So even though it's not funding, it's a great first step. Same with MTAs where you're exchanging samples or technologies, um, I think that can be really helpful for step as well. Um, finally, most of all, be persistent. 
build those relationships over time. It's not going to happen right away. And then make sure you're aligning with their opportunities um, that they are putting out. So, you know, we always say we're matchmakers because we're trying to match up what they are trying to, problems are trying to address with the VC as solutions within the innovator, you know, private sector universe. So bringing that together as a match is ultimately what we're all trying to do. Um, really want to emphasize persistence though. You know, as an entrepreneur, I had to be persistent to get GDG to where we are today and uh, be persistent in my relationships, persistent in my approach. I think any entrepreneur out there gets that. Um, so just keep that in mind. I would just add in politely persistent uh, so that we remain uh, friendly with folks. But that's really, really important. Um, we've got lots of stories where, you know, you don't get it the first try, but you get it the second try. Or the first conversation wasn't a great conversation. It didn't seem like they were listening or they were engaged. And then it turns out they become your biggest champion. So persistence is super, super important um, in this process. So I think that's the tips. Um, I'm sure there's more things to cover. Uh, next slide, please. And then we're closing out with that's our contact information. We are all available to you. Um, if you have any questions, we want to make sure that we are a resource for you. And as I said, this is recorded and we will send out these slides. And with that, I'd love to um, turn it back to Greg, maybe to lead us through some questions, if that works. Yeah, that'd be great. So okay. um, we do have some questions that have that have uh, made it into the queue and, and please uh, feel free to add, add some more. But the first question was around, is there a list of acronyms? And I'll just say when it comes to this, the DOD is acronym soup, the whole industry is, but NIH, all of those. So I have a couple thoughts on this. One is, if there were acronyms within our presentation, the slides where we had the graphics or the, the logos of, of a lot of these grant opportunities, those are all spelled out for you there. Um, unfortunately, there's not a one-stop shop for all acronyms. So I can think of if there's like within CDMRP, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, if you're applying for a grant there, oftentimes within the grant announcement, they'll have a list of acronyms in the back. Same goes for other things. But um, I've really found that Google or whatever search engine, if I don't know what an acronym is, I'll type it in and, and just do a search there. So um, I don't know if Liz or Aditya, you wanted to say anything more about acronyms um, other than what I've just said. No, I think that was good. Okay, cool. Um, the other one is uh, someone had asked if the Rapid Innovation Fund program is back in place. And it is not, to my knowledge, it is not um, back. Yeah, they definitely put a moratorium on that um, for a few years now. Um, and it was initially created to supplant um, ear, the removal of earmarks because um, a lot of earmarks would go through defense to companies. And uh, so when they eliminated those for about 11 years, they then created the Rapid Inno Innovation Program. Um, I do know that there was an effort to bring it back. Um, so I'm triple checking right now, but yeah, no, I don't, I did not. Yeah. It, I don't think it's been brought back, but I know that there is some interest in doing that. Good. Um, we had a question just about the confirmation for MHSRS being in August. What we do know at this point is, um, they have announced that they are targeting mid August of 2023. So there's not an official date and there probably won't be for some time. But it is helpful to know this year that they are trying to target uh, mid-August again, where which is when it usually was. And last year, they had moved it to September. But I think that that had to do with there might have been a conflict with some other big event going on um, in Kissimmee. Now, the other thing that's not 100% confirmed yet is that it's going to be back in Kissimmee, Florida at the Gaylord. I would be surprised if they move it. I mean, it, it is possible, but... I. Um, for all intents and purposes, I'm planning on them to return to Kissimmee, Florida at the Gaylord. Um, and then th the date and location specifically haven't been set yet, but that's the best intel we have to go on at this point. And we'll know more um, as we get into May, June, um, they should be announcing all of that. Um, this one is probably for Liz. Can you clarify if 
are the government set asides only available to nonprofits? Yes. When you, well, when you say a set aside, do you, if you mean an earmark, community project funding, or congressionally directed spending, yes, it is only a nonprofit that can be a recipient. However, you can do programmatic increases in spending um, that are for a specific kind of technology or like a directive to the agency, and then a company can apply for those and get that funding. Okay, perfect. Um, so we have we have an ongoing experiment. Are we eligible for submitting for an abstract and full paper on pilot data? So the question, the first question is around pilot data and being able to submit to an abstract. Aditya, did you want to take that one? Um, I would say that if you can definitely show relevance to the military, that's what definitely counts a lot more than where you are currently. I think definitely as a scientist myself, I, I understand that that judgment call, should I submit, should I submit? I would say just go ahead and submit so long as you can make that clear connection to what the military's priorities are and you can articulate where you're going with your data. And in any case, um, as I mentioned before, you're not really allowed to show any visuals or charts or anything like that. So I'm pretty sure so long as you can articulate what your pilot data is showing you in words, uh, that should be sufficient for the time being. Great. And, and just, to, just to reiterate, one of the slides that Aditya presented was there are actually two different abstracts or two formats this year. In the past, they didn't really give guidance over the format or what type of abstract that they, they would take, but there is the research angle. Um, and then there's also the advanced development angle. So those are two opportunities. And if you're not selected for a podium presentation, then in many cases, you're then selected to do a poster presentation where you can put in your graphs and charts and all of that. It's the initial abstract application is pretty, it's pretty plain, um, no, no, no fancy stuff in, in that. So, um, all right. Um, they receive, oh, so Liz, you've worked quite a bit with the Joint Warfighter Medical Research Program. And so for people who don't know this, this is a program that um, is pretty much available for companies that already have DOD funding. And so this particular person asks, they received a good, a score of good on a recent Joint Warfighter Medical Research Program. Um, is it possible to resubmit to broad agency announcement and address comments by reviewers? Sure. Um, so I can't tell if you received the Joint Warfighter funding, but the Joint Warfighter funding also was created when they eliminated earmarks. And initially you had to have been a past recipient of earmarks in order to get that money, but then they broadened it to, you just had to have received a grant or some kind of government funding before to apply for it. And a lot of it is your program manager advocating for you to get additional funding. So if you got good on, the, on your submission and there's feedback there that, that would then apply to a VAA, yes, because a lot of these are the same reviewers, um, especially like Army, military, medical, it's the same men and women um, that are in that room deciding. So yes, I would think that it would be very wise to use um, similar language. Yep. And I'll also say that we worked with a company that submitted to the congressionally directed medical research program, the burn, the military burn program. And they got some, they applied two years ago, they got feedback. Um, they were not awarded, but then they, they took that, they reapplied, they kind of, they had a newer version of their technology and they, they made some changes and they were doing some different clinical research. And they actually got invited. So they took those comments to heart, reapplied for the same mechanism the following year. And then um, they were actually invited to do a full submission. They haven't received word yet if they've gotten a, an award. And I know that that's not, G, that's not Joint Warfighter Medical Research Program, but absolutely use that um, feedback to guide your ability to submit. And I think everybody may know, or in just case you're not, you can't double dip. So you can't you can't accept money for the same project. So you can't, you know, so you want to be cognizant of that, that you're not reapplying where some someplace you've already received money. So just 
wanted to point that out. Um, let's see, this is a pretty, well, there's a question here about HARPA, but I believe that that person might be meaning ARPA-H. So Liz or Aditya, do you want to talk about ARPA-H and what you know about that and kind of where it's at and status and program managers and yeah, I'll start off and Aditya can add anything if, um, if I miss anything. So we actually just did a call with uh, our age leadership um, last week. We talked with their chief of staff and their communications director, a couple others. Um, I've talked to Renee directly um, about two months ago. Just a great group of people, very dedicated to innovation and really want to make sure that they are funding initiatives that consider not just the innovative, transformative way they can improve patient outcomes, but also the end user application and utility, super important to her. Um, and right now they are consumed with getting their program managers hired. So while there's been some scuttle about where they're gonna be located and you know what exactly are they gonna be doing, they keep telling us their number one thing is these program managers. They want to fill those positions, make sure they've got the right people in there who are innovative thinkers, um, not just focused on basic research. They want like innovative, um, you know, DARPA-like projects coming out of ARPA age. So that is their focus now. I also heard um, from the chief of staff privately a few months ago that they are trying to get money out the door by the end, by summer or end of this current fiscal year, um, with the delay with the budget and everything else, I think it would, we're lucky if they get it by September. But that means that a couple of months before that, obviously they have to put out RFPs or some information on how people apply for funding. So all of that is underway now. Um, and now that it's been funded, it's been included in a couple of bills now, I do think it is here to stay. And a lot of the um, challenges are just figuring out how to get this thing up and running um, so that it can actually happen. Great. Um, all right. Um, we do have a question that was really specific about BARDA on what to expect for the, and I'm happy to field this one because we actually have a market research call coming up um, next Monday with, with BARDA, but somebody asked what, what to expect in a BARDA market call or initial call before application is submitted. So what I would recommend is that if you have, if somebody is already connected with you to set up that market research call, it's perfectly within bounds to ask them, hey, is there, are there particular things that you want us to cover or that we should touch on? But absent that, what I would suggest is that to prepare for that, you'd want some sort of slide deck that's pretty short to the point um, that gives a, brief description of your company, your leadership um, that talks about your technology. Um, you will also be expected to give an explanation of the, the technology readiness level and where your technology is. And I would just be cognizant of the fact that they have different TRLs for medical devices and different TRLs for vaccines and um, uh, drugs um, or therapeutics. Um, so be ready for that. And then in the call that we're having coming up, they specifically asked us to talk about the FDA pathway um, and give any sort of feedback about where we are in the development plan and what our regulatory strategy is related to that going forward. Um, and then also wanting to be able to demonstrate how your data relates to BARDA and specifically the areas of interest in the broad agency announcement that you might be going, uh, that you might be applying for. Um, and then um, we usually close out with any sort of slide uh, slide on the point of contact name, phone number, and email address. So um, hopefully that answers your question. And I know it was a little bit specific, but hopefully it's helpful for everybody. All right. It looks like we are at the top of the hour. And um, I'll just say Thank you for joining us and uh, appreciate everybody's participation. And Liz, I'll kick it over to you for any, any final words. But before I do that, I'll just say we are going to send out the slide deck and we'll send out the, the uh, recording. So thanks for joining us. And Liz, anything you wanted to say in closing? Yeah, thank you all for dialing in. Uh, the one other comment I wanted to make is the Defense um, Innovation Unit is still operating and functioning. Um, they have about uh, 50 
uh, million to spend on innovation in this most recent appropriations bill. So that is another resource um, to pursue. But thank you so much for dialing in. Uh, we will do another webinar before MHSRS. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you've got our emails. We'll follow up with you um, as you plan for your abstract submission. But please stay tuned. We've got lots of updates on grant funding, on planning for this conference, and just ways to work with DOD and the government. So thanks again for joining. Awesome. And I'll just also say real quick, if we didn't answer your question and you still want an answer, we weren't able to get to every single question, please reach out to us. You've got our emails and we'd love to have a conversation offline if, if you need to. So thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.